Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I see that some people are still dropping in. Uh, we're 14 now. And for what I learned yesterday, it's not about the amount of people that enter the room, but about the quality of the conversation. So that's what we're aiming for today. Um, so I'll just give it a, one more minute to see how many more people are joining and then we'll just kick off. And in the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself um, in the chat box so people know who are joining. All right, I was hoping for a 20 to start, a, more, a nice round number, but maybe 19 is just perfect. Um, all right, let me just give it a start um, and then people will just continue dropping into the conversation I'm, I'm expecting, that's all right. Um, all right, so yeah, people are introducing themselves in the chat box, wonderful. All right, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening uh, once again. Um, very glad to have you all in this session called Bridging the Barriers to Upscaling of CBA. Um, in the coming one and a half hour, we'll be discussing the barriers to upscaling community-based adaptation and which actions are needed to put the locally-led adaptation principles into practice. Um, briefly, we'll refer to them as the LLA principles. Um, my name is Melvin van der Veen and I'll be the moderator of this session. My colleague Dan Robin and I have organized this session together with Perry in Semfego of Sendep, uh, Cameroon and Violet Matiru of MCDI in Kenya. Now, before um, we kick off the conversation and we'll get to the presentations, um, there are some housekeeping rules that I'd briefly like to share with you. Um, I've listed them uh, for you, for your convenience on the screen. Um, but in addition to these housekeeping rules, um, I'd also like to request that you write your questions to the speakers or panelists uh, in the chat box. And after the presentations uh, by the first speakers, um, we'll have a few minutes to ask questions for clarification. So after the, each presentation, there'll be uh, a few minutes for questions for clarification. Um, following, following the presentations, we'll have a more lively discussion together with the panelists. And I'll try to keep a close eye on the questions in the chat box, uh, but it can be a bit messy at times. So um, I'll try to integrate them as good as possible into the conversation, but I can also expect that if the conversation is very lively and energetic, it will be uh, tough to do so. So please bear with me. Um, and lastly, uh, a request is to please keep your microphone on mute during the session and feel free to turn your camera on. All right. Um, so about the session. The intention of today's session is really to facilitate a lively conversation um, in which we'll try to get a better understanding of the barriers to upscaling of CBA, community-based adaptation, um, at both ends, we've really set for ourselves the goal to upscale and mainstream bottom-up practices, um, CBA if you like, supported by favorable government governance systems and financial resources. Uh, but sure, it's easier said than done. And I'm quite confident that together we can bridge those barriers, uh, each with our own network, expertise, capacities. Uh, and that's also why we've invited today's speakers and panelists from very different angles. So we have people from 
more the community, uh, working with communities on the ground, NGOs working on a more national or sub-national level, uh, but also financiers, um, donors, uh, policy makers, um, and then of course we still have the audience as well uh, participating. Um, so for this conversation we're accompanied by Argya Sinja Roy of the Asian Development Bank, uh, Heather McGray of the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, Mohamed Abakar Asoyuti of the Adaptation Fund, and Karen Stehauer of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, to which we refer as RVO uh, for its Dutch abbreviation. And then, of course, we still have Violet and Perry, as I introduced them already, from joining from Cameroon, or actually from Uganda. Perry's in Uganda at the moment, uh, and Violet from Kenya. All right. So just very briefly about the LLA principles, there are eight principles and I'm not going into detail, but just, you know, I'd like to share them on the screen for those who are not that familiar with the principles who have not maybe attended all the sessions during uh, throughout the conference. Um, so these uh, LLA principles are really central to uh, this year's conference. Uh, how are we going to put these into practice? Um, they really sound very straightforward, but there will be challenges for sure. Um, the eight principles are based on five years of action research and dialogue between IIED, the World Research Institute, and more than 50 adaptation stakeholders in support of the Global Commission on Adaptation's locally led adaptation track, which was, I believe, in 2021. Um, and they've now been endorsed by over 80 civil society organizations and government. At least the 80 is the number I, I found. It could be more uh, by today. And I think most people here will agree that these principles, if put into practice, will help to strengthen CBA, community-based adaptation, and also to ensure a longer term and more effective uh, adaptation outcomes. But yeah, as mentioned by the developers of the principles themselves, um, they are not a quick fix. Um, putting them into practice will be challenging for quite a number of reasons, which may be context dependent uh, as well. Um, so what are such barriers to implementing, to putting them into practice, and how can we overcome those? That is uh, the question for today's conversation. But before we get into the conversation and the uh, presentations. There is, of course, a Mentimeter, um, and you can go to the Menti and participate uh, by going to menti.com and use the code as mentioned on the screen, um, or you can simply scan the QR code with your mobile device. And if everyone is entering the Mentimeter, then I'm expecting to see some dots on this upside down map to see where everyone is coming from. Can I put the link in the chat? Yeah, so you go to www.menti.com and enter the code 33244182. All right, so people are managing to find their location, at least I'm expecting on the map. There's someone calling from the coast in the US, I think, could be the sea, not sure. Someone from Europe. North America a lot, South America also. The UK, yeah. I also need to think, uh, what am I seeing? Um, that will be Middle East, I'm assuming. It's an icebreaker. It's not, it's not too serious. It's, it's meant to make us think differently. But we're... 20 people, so I'm still missing some dots. So just waiting for a, 
a little moment. All right. I think we can go to the next one. And this will make you think, I hope, about the content of today's session. Please mention one key barrier you're facing to putting the LLA principles into practice. Just one. I'm, I know many of you will be like, but there are so many. At least I expect. Just mention one, corruption. All right, there you go. Access to finance, yeah. Good that we have some people think finance in the room. Greed, okay. Centralized governance. A lack of harmonization, I'm expecting. Budget templates, uh -huh. bureaucracy, perhaps. Accountability. Hmm. Lack of women leadership. Oh, women in leadership. Mm -hmm. Top down climate planning. So a lot is about trust, bureaucracy, um, governance. Still some coming in. Patient predictable funds, or maybe a lack thereof. Yeah. All right, these, these barriers sound quite familiar and I think we'll be touching upon quite some of those as well. Yeah, cultural patriarchy. Yeah, so patriarchy is, is also one of the barriers. Yeah, we'll be touching upon quite a few of those in the conversation or maybe all of them, maybe. Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, I'll change my screen again. All right, there you go. All right, thank you for filling out the Menti. Um, that was quite useful to, um, to see what you're thinking of when we talk about barriers to putting the LLA principles into practice and still some are coming in, um, which is wonderful. So please keep on putting them into the, into the Menti if you like, but we'll also you know, go to the next part of this session, which is the presentation by Sendep. Um, please, Barry. Um, can I give you the floor? Thank you so much. Melvin, greetings everybody. And you're welcome to this uh, presentation that centers on uh, community-based adaptation, addressing the barriers and exploring opportunities in gender just climate solutions in Cameroon, Uganda, and in Zimbabwe. Next slide, please. Uh, we, the context of our work is about uh, is climate related, and uh, we have. Uh, I'm going to talk about the context, the problem, the practice briefly, and then we'll look at the barriers and also links to to these barriers to the LLA principles. Then we'll look at some recommendations and opportunities. Next slide. Um, the overview of our work as SENDEP uh, is climate related. And like I said, uh, the impacts of climate change affects a lot of countries in Africa and uh, we work in relation with uh, the International Analog Forestry Network and the Global Alliance for Green and Gender Action. So it's a two-pronged uh, approach we're using, how to restore ecosystems and how to advocate with grassroots women groups for, for natural, natural resource management action. So in Cameroon, uh, the work, our work is related to socioeconomic injustices meted against women, poverty, 
as well as other uh, environmental protection uh, limitations. In Uganda, uh, there is need to mobilize and empower women groups in achieving good stewardship natural resource management issues, both at the household and at the community. In Zimbabwe, uh, the key issue there are droughts, drought conditions caused by prolonged absence of rainfall and also deforestation and poor mining practices. Next slide, please. The next slide is talking about the problems. What are the key problems uh, we encounter uh, in trying to work uh, with grassroots groups? Um, in Cameroon, the key problem is the vulnerability. The grassroots groups are very, very vulnerable to climate change and climate impacts. There are lots of uh, access and uh, limitations to land use and the abuses in that area. There are conflicting uh, conflicts between farmers and grazers and also land grabbing tendencies. In Uganda, the key problems there are the rates of deforestation, which is very high, leading to decreased biodiversity and soil degradation, and landslides. For those of you who are very current with the news, you will remember in eastern Uganda, there are lots of landslides going on there in Mount Elgon region this year due to high rainfall and, 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 and poor soil conservation practices. Weak governance, as far as natural resource management is concerned, also a key issue affecting grassroots uh, uh, communities in a in Uganda in taking up uh, good stewardship for, for land use and uh, natural resource management issues. In Zimbabwe, soil degradation, the drying up of seasonal streams, which is related to drought, has re resulted in water crisis affecting huge swathes of uh, uh, the midlands of Zimbabwe. And this is also aggravated by the mining companies. The, the, the operations are, are, are not uh, friendly to the environment lead to pollution of uh, water bodies. And so the solutions that have been provided so far are borehouse, but these have been experienced, uh, they have experienced a lot of maintenance challenges. So they have a key issue of water crisis there, which is also related to the climate impacts we are talking about. How do these communities adapt to these problems? Uh, we are going to look at it in the practice that we, we think we can, we've been working with the community to see how they can uh, avert some of these crises. Next slide, please. The practices that we are doing with the communities are too pronged, like I said. We are, we are looking at the restoration of ecosystems due to soil degradation and other climate related uh, hazards. And so we use the approach of analog forestry, which is an uh, ecological restoration uh, technique to restore degraded areas in all these countries and at the grassroots. So we engage a lot of women groups environmental justice groups and women rights groups to see how they can restore their ecosystems, restore their lands from uh, that have been degraded over the years. So we use that approach of analog forest, but we also use advocacy techniques, advocacy and lobbying techniques to see how we can uh, negotiate with the powerful interests that are within the countries. Like I said, the mining companies in Zimbabwe and also decision makers involved in natural resource management approaches in Uganda and in Cameroon. We're using advocacy taxes to see how we can negotiate with them so that they can uh, uh, provide favorable uh, uh, decisions uh, 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 towards, towards women groups and also towards uh, marginalized and vulnerable groups in the communities. Next slide, please. The barriers. Um, restoring ecosystems has not come without barriers, or advocacy has not come without barriers. And uh, during the work that we've been doing, we've identified four, four major barriers the cultural, the social, the financial, and the political. And all these barriers go as a long way to, 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 to limit the work we do in the field. Cultural, first, the question of tenure security and patriarchy. Patriarchy is a traditional uh, cultural systems uh, uh, practice in, uh, in most African countries where the man is the head of the house and he takes all the decisions and the women are related to the background. It affects them in land ownership uh, access and also uh, getting a, 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 a rights to land as a whole. So that is a very a huge impediment to our work. Socially, we have questions of leadership skills. The women groups themselves lack the leadership skills to negotiate to make their voices heard and grassroots. 
And also, this also comes with capacity building. There's uh, issues of capacity building within the group. So they need, the capacity need to be built. They need to have a lot of exposure in some of these thematic issues as far as climate change is concerned so that they can be able to make their voices heard at the grassroots and talk to their local leaders to take their problems forward. Um, a key point also is uh, in Zimbabwe is the social integration within families where the girl childs are the ones doing most of the, the water, they fetch most of the water and they check for long distances to fetch water. So it, 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 it results in some kind of dislocation within the family. We've noticed that in Zimbabwe and also in Uganda. Key financial constraints, of course, is the very short-term uh, grants that are being awarded to grassroots uh, CSOs to do their work. Uh, you have a grant of one year, two years. It's difficult for you to 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 to, to function with that kind of with that kind of short-term grant because the issues are the problems are enormous. The negotiations take a longer period with with the companies and with decision makers. So the grant period of one to two years may not even go beyond a negotiation cycle. So there is need to, it's a huge barrier that we are facing in the field and we need to, to reckon that this uh, financial uh, barrier especially be looked, looked upon. Politically, uh, the mining companies, especially in Zimbabwe, have a huge influence uh, with, the, with the local politics. So there's a lot of corruption as far as land allocation and land uh, registration is concerned. And this has, uh, uh, drastic effects in land ownership and uh, access by women groups and vulnerable groups. There's impunity from political uh, powerful interests, especially the owners of the mines who also have links with uh, uh, the ruling parties in some countries like in Zimbabwe. There's human rights abuse. And then in some extreme cases in Cameroon, we're experiencing an armed conflict in our project area. So it becomes difficult to, 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 to organize dialogue spaces, to organize meetings with some of these uh, women groups. Next slide, please. The next slide I've linked, I've tried to present the link between these barriers and the, LL, the, the local adapted principles to see where the barriers link with the principles and what uh, we can do or the panelists can do to overcome some of these barriers. So if you look at cultural, the cultural barrier, we talk of tenure security and patriarchy. Uh, I think we think that principle one and two uh, can address these issues. When you look at the social barriers, lack of leadership and capacity, principle four and five, investing in local capabilities to leave an institutional legacy, build a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty. These are principles that in general can address these social barriers. When you look at the financial aspects where we say grants do not really last uh, set activities or negotiation cycles, then providing patient and predictable funding can be, as, well, can be assessed easily, can also assist in helping to resolve this barrier and also ensuring transparency and accountability. These principles are very, very nice. They can address some of these barriers, but it's not, uh, it's not easy as uh, said and done, like Nevin also said. Principle six, which is uh, flexible programming and learning, cut across all of these principles. So it's a cross-cutting principle which we think uh, can also is useful and also uh, cut across all the barriers that I've mentioned. Next slide, please. Having said all that, I think uh, we have some recommendations and there are opportunities that uh, we think can be explored at the grassroots level to encourage CSOs and grassroots groups to understand what climate change is all about and how they can be supported. So Sendep has a lot of trust. We've built a lot of trust over the years with uh, grassroots groups in the delivery of certain actions and activities. We understand the local context, the traditional knowledge and the political uh, uh, context. And uh, some key recommendations which uh, we've outlined, which could be looked into. Next slide, Mary. As per the recommendations, one of the key recommendations would be uh, working at the grassroots level, especially, and I will, I will return to the case of Zimbabwe, where we have some peculiar human rights abuses there, as far as uh, working with mining, the mines are concerned. It's always important to allocate some special human rights defenders form so that the women 
who are usually afraid to speak up and to make their voices heard, and who are afraid of being violated upon. Their rights are abused most often. How can they be rehabilitated? So there's need for some that kind of fund that is kept aside to rehabilitate those whose rights have been abused. It will give them an encouragement to continue the work that they are doing. And also there is a need for continual involvement of local authorities. That is also crucial. The local authorities at the grassroots level, we need to engage them all the time to understand the processes, the dynamics, the changes that are occurring in the field so that they also make those uh, changes at their own uh, uh, policy uh, development uh, and decision-making level. Strengthening of women groups at the grassroots level is also a key thing, capacity building. I think I have a question for that. So if all these recommendations are looked into, we think that at the grassroots level, we will be able to make a step further towards climate change adaptation practices and helping these grassroots communities in achieving uh, uh, some of the, uh, or the, the sustainable development goals, which are 17 in number, and we are far from even uh, achieving them because of some of these barriers. So thank you very much for your time. And we're looking forward to any fruitful questions and discussions uh, following these presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry, for a clear presentation within your time, which is much appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the time for some uh, questions for clarification uh, from the audience. And if Alice uh, would like to contribute uh, from a perspective from uh, the community, so to say, in Zimbabwe, uh, please go ahead. You have still one or two minutes, uh, if you like, because I don't see questions in the chat box. Uh, all right. Um, like uh, Pet has presented, we're actually based in a very small town which is rich in mineral deposits, but yet the locals are very poor. So we have been having problems of, uh, you know, a perennial droughts. And, um, you know, as women are responsible for water and uh, much of agricultural activities. So we have been facing a lot of problems, but uh, we have been doing our own initiatives, like uh, doing water harvesting activities during the uh, farming season. And um, I think Perry mentioned something about um, our bowls drying up. So as women and as our, our organization, we've been recharging the bowls through our water, um, water harvesting techniques. So what we have been actually trying to do was like to engage with the mining companies because we can't be that poor when we have so many uh, mineral resources. We have diamonds. We have gold, we have platinum in that small town. So what we have been like for now, what we have been advocating for is we don't have water in our communities, but the, the mines are taking water in most, most of our big rivers. So of late, we have been asking for one single water point because they take water from the rivers, they pass through our communities to their mines. So we've been just asking them to leave one water point so what we want now is um, for the women in the communities to, to be trained and uh, so that they know their rights and they can be really empowered enough to engage the minds and also to claim their rights because we will, after they take their water and purify it because they have resources, the women have to walk about 10 to 15 kilometers to go and fish unpurified water. Whereas the purified water passes through our um, our, our communities. So the other thing is, if women are empowered enough, I think they'll be able to, you know, to, 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 to be firm enough to claim their rights. So we also, we're looking at having like biocultural protocols, whereby we have a good document that we can go with to the mines to, to advocate for what we want as the communities. As I'm just talking to you right now, there is a mine which is pegging close to our agroecological agro center at Monde Trust. And I'm told that that mine was discovered in the 18th by DBS. But now that's, they, have, they haven't consulted the locals. And they are going to be, their fields are going to be disturbed, their water points are going to be disturbed. So even in the, um, uh, the project that we have been doing of analog forest, it still needs, we still need water. 
So women are the ones who are actually digging uh, the swells for water harvesting activities and the ponds to be able to water the trees that we are planting for the livelihoods. Thank you, Alice. Sorry. Um, sorry, sorry for cutting you short, but I think that the, the perspective that you share from, so to say, the local uh, community is really, really helpful. Um, maybe I can ask you to uh, to leave it uh, here for now, and then later in the conversation you can contribute in the in the discussion. Is that right, uh, Alice? Yes, that's all right. All right. Thank you so much, because I don't want to eat up the time of uh, Violet for her presentation. So, um, Violet, please, could you take the floor in um, uh, presenting the work that you do in Kenya? OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Melvin and Dan, for coordinating this, this work. Because it's relevant, I'll start by just introducing myself and the other people who I'm representing today. I don't come here alone. I'm both an independent consultant. So I do a lot of evaluations of the diff different programs, both government programs and also foundations. At the same time, I'm with a community-based organization called Millennium Community Development Initiatives. And when I served as a grant advisor for the Global Green Grants for 16 years, through the up, up, um, recommending small grants to communities, I got the idea to try and link communities along the Athi River through what we now call the Athi River Community Network. So the Athi River Community Network brings communities who live along the Athi River, which is the second longest river in Kenya, which passes through the city of Nairobi. So you can imagine the kind of uh, pollution that happens when it passes through the city of Nairobi. But then the waters continue to the semi-arid Ukambani area, which the communities there draw water from the same river. So with the heavy metals and their high levels of cancers and all that, and it flows all the way to the Indian Ocean. So we work with community-based organizations, water resource users associations, and community forestry associations along that river. That gives us a site of coherence in the work we do. So we try to look for funding. We are currently working with both ends, implementing agroecology agro -ecology and water governance initiatives, because we realize that farmers are doing using a lot of chemicals which are going directly into the rivers, including Roundup, which has been shown to cause cancers. So we are working to help them learn how to grow food using organic methods and also how to conserve the riparian areas to protect the springs. So we work with many communities. So today, we were, uh, I was to be joined by Halimishi Yusuf, who, is, who started off in civil society. She joined as one of the early members of the Athi River Community Network, addressing issues of sand harvesting. And now she's actually just uh, starting her PhD program on river sand and biodiversity loss, river sand mining and biodiversity loss at Newcastle University. And I'll, later in my presentation, I'll talk about the work that Halinishi has been doing in Makweni County. So she's joined local government and that helps get the ideas to a much a bigger scale. So please go to the next slide. So that, that, that it's been accepted that yes, locally led adaptation, there's a, a broad agreement that yes, it is a good thing. Then it's also an agreement that there is need for multi stakeholder collaboration to support locally led adaptation. And then there's also been a sort of general agreement that there's need for getting away from business as usual approach to promoting resilience. And there, do, there exist small good examples, but they tend to be relatively small. So genuine community-based adapt adaptation is still difficult to achieve. Go to the next slide, please. And the barriers that result in the rhetoric in support of community-based adaptation not actually becoming the reality on a broad scale. There are several reasons. 
And one of the reasons we found is when these policies are not actionable. So you have these broad statements coming from conferences, including a conference like this, but they are not supported by a relevant legal framework. And then they are not financially, technically, institutionally, and socially supported. So, and then like what Alice has been saying, the most vulnerable are left behind. So the policies, laws, institution, and policies most times are not clearly understood across the board, especially by communities. When you take any law, natural resource law, it has a lot of legalese, it has a lot of technical terms, and it is even usually in, for example, in my country, it's in the English language, yet many of the community members understand Kiswahili or the local language base. And apart from a place like Tanzania, where they actually translate the laws into Kiswahili, in Kenya, there's no translation of these policies. So for the, for the most times, people don't even understand what they contain. Go to the next slide, please. So when stakeholders' roles in support of community-based adaptation are not clearly understood or defined, it results in overlap of roles. For example, in Kenya, in 2013, we did what is called devolution. So we have 47 counties, but there's still a lot of overlap of roles between the national government institutions and the local institutions. And the dangerous part with this overlap of roles is that financial resources that are allocated for certain mandates are left at the national level, yet the function has been devolved to the local county level. So it's ridiculous because the national institution ends up controlling the resources, but it is the county that is supposed to do soil and water cons conservation measures. So there is conflict between national and county level le levels of government. Then there is an over-reliance on certain categories of stakeholders. These categories of stakeholders are almost like sacred cows, and it's supposed to be like they can address all our problems. And one of these, which is very dangerous, is this push for private sector, for everything, lack of water, and low water accessibility. Oh, everybody says, let's do private pub public partnerships. But what are the implications of bringing in the private sector, especially when we can't control private sector? And there's very little control of private sector. Look at Coca-Cola around the world. It destroys water sources. It pollutes with single-use plastic bottles. But even in its country of origin, they can't control it. But that yet you will hear the Nature Conservancy saying, we're going to do conservation and we are going into partnership with Coca-Cola so that communities can be taught about soil and water uh, conservation. But down the stream, Coca-Cola is clogging our streams with plastic bottles. So those kinds of ridiculous situations where there is a disconnect be between what private sector says it wants to do and what it's actually doing. So then there is, there is limited context-based models. We tend to support these one-size-fits-all approaches, which don't really work. Go to the next slide, please. So some strategies for reducing the barriers to upscaling is the development of context-specific community-based adaptation approaches where we understand, where we invest more in understanding the historical and cultural context that have undermined or promoted community-based adaptation. Today, we were supposed to be joined by people from Isiolo County, that is in Northern Kenya. They couldn't come in because their internet is giving them problems, but one of them is a member of the county assembly, newly elected, is called Major Jilo Dima, and one of the problems with Northern Kenya and promoting community-based adaptation is that Northern Kenya has been deliberately marginalized during the colonial times and after, even with the new independent government. So there's been a situation where if conservation interests want land in Northern Kenya, they just declare areas as national parks. The latest one was in the 90s with the Laikipia National Park, where the Nature Conservancy gave money 
to the African Wildlife Foundation and they purchased land and kicked out Samburu communities. And that was declared a Laikipia National Park controlled by the National Bank government with no consideration of the local people. So that context is very important. Then we need to see culturally, financially, and institutionally relevant, appropriate CBA approaches. And then we need to provide opportunities for community learning among themselves. So we are currently organizing for the communities in Isiolo to go visit the communities around Masai Mara because they share similar issues and there have been different approaches in them addressing those issues so that they can design their own approaches to getting more control over the management of their natural resources. Next slide, please. So clearly, another strategy is to clearly define stakeholders' roles and comparative strengths, competencies, and weaknesses. For example, the government has a very clear role in regulation. And that role, it can play very strongly because it's elected. But then the government institutions also have challenges because of bureaucracy, similarly with private sector. Private sector can come up with some very innovative strategies to address some of these issues. But at the end of the day, Private sector is profit driven. So there needs to be checks and balances that limit the extent to which private sector can take over national, natural resources and push out communities. Then we need to assess which is appropriate upscaling, which is appropriate. Is it upscaling? Is it replication or adaptation, inspiration? These examples we have, what is the best approach? Please go to the next slide. So these are the principles, and I won't repeat them because Melvin already went over them. Go to the next slide. So I'm going to use the example of uh, Makweni County Sand Conservation Initiative, which is being spearheaded by Halinishi as the founding managing director of the Makweni County Sand Conservation and Utilization Authority. Go to the next slide. Just uh, time-wise, uh, Violet, do you think you can manage this one in four minutes? Yes, yes. All right, I, thank I you. My, my stop clock is on. So Perfect. I'm, All right. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So, okay, for uh, continue. So sand harvesting, especially in counties that are very near the city, is a major destruction of rivers because there's a lot of the sand that is removed. Then when it rains, there's a lot of runoff and the rivers don't hold sand. Then there's a lot of conflicts, especially because of the ready money. So a lot of school dropouts as young men go to the sand harvesting business, and then also young girls go to find these young men who have a lot of money. So it has a lot of economic, social issues. Then it also destroys the infrastructure because they destroy the sand so much. So you have this gully erosion. Go to the next, next slide. So once um, uh, Halinishi joined the Athi River Community Network because we approached her because of her, she comes from Makweni County. So when she joined, she was in civil society. She was in the, uh, an NGO and they started some work with Via Water, which is a Dutch organization, creating awares, awareness about sand harvesting and its damages. Then she was invited to be the founding managing director of the Sand Harvesting Authority of Makweni County by the governor. So when she did, she did that, she's been able to put in place mechanisms. You can go to the next slide because that gives the background of Makweni County. So she was able to, they, as a county, were able to put mechanism for fast. The first thing they did was to stop sand harvesting and sand exporting out of the county, out of Makweni County. Then they, the county put in place mechanism for the revenue that was collected from the fees paid by people ha harvesting sand, a fraction of it was earmarked for conserving the sand, the, the, the rivers that had been adversely affected by sand harvesting. That means sand dams, which you'll see in the next slide. Please go to the next slide. 
So let's we'll come back to this. Let's go to the slide where we see the pictures. Okay, so you can see in that that case is a river because of excessive sand harvesting, even the, the banks collapse. Then they then put structures like these sand dams and gabions. Go to the next slide, you see another another picture where it's a big wall. These, these are very dramatic. When you see before and after in any of these situations, this wall is put usually in a very degraded uh, uh, river, but after some time, it captures so much sun that you can't see the wall, as you can see in the second, in the second picture. So the good thing with this initiative is that, go to the next slide, is, is that it is institutionalized into the county government. So the next slide you see is where they do a water tank within the river, and that brings in water. And this is the water that is pumped to supply the city. So just as an example, so this has devolved the decision making to the lower level of the counties and is even working with the water resource users associations. And then it is institutionalized into law. And then it involves the youth, it involves women, their benefits they see from these rehabilitated uh, uh, rivers. So that brings a, a, an opportunity for upscaling these community-based adaptation initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Violet, for this presentation. And um, I think that the two presentations have been very complimentary, actually. And um, I think this is the time for some questions for clarification to the presentation by Violet. If there are any, I haven't seen any in the chat box. So maybe it was very clear. Okay, wonderful. All right, um, then we'll take it to the conversation uh, with the panelists. And for this part of the session, I'm inviting the panelists to join the floor, um, which can be uh, turning on your camera if you like. Um, so the three central, more uh, general questions to this conversation between the speakers and the panelists are shared on the screen. So the first one is, how can the LLA, so locally led adaptation principles, bridge the barriers to upscaling of CBA? Then what else or more is needed to help CBA thrive? And lastly, what needs to or who needs to take which actions to put these LA principles into practice? So those are like the three questions around which we'll be having this discussion, um, but these are quite generic and I'll stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone joining in this conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with a more a simpler question, which, which relates to the, the presentations um, and, you know, we're not trying to find the, the silver bullet in this conversation. It's really, we'll try to first understand like, what is, what is everyone doing? Eh? What is your organization doing in trying to tackle these barriers that, that have been addressed by the speakers? Um, so I'm curious to know uh, from the panelists, what strikes you most about the barriers, and there were many that were shared by the speakers, and what is your organization doing to address these or trying to do to address these barriers? Um, and maybe I'll just go in alphabetic order and I'll just start with Argya uh, to ask him like, what is the ADB for example, doing to address certain barriers and what strikes you most from those shared by the speakers? Uh, thank you, Melvin, and a very good afternoon, evening everybody from Manila. Uh, first of all, thanks to Bodens for organizing this dialogue and for inviting us. And a big thank you to the two presenters. It was a great presentation. Uh, much to learn from Africa always. Um, so I just want to um, uh, just give a context that I come, I work for Asian Development Bank. So by nature, the, our counterpart or stakeholders that we work with are governments and in most cases, central governments or national governments. Um, so what we do and what our strategy is very much dictated by what our, who our stakeholders are. So, I, I mean, from our perspective, I think um, where uh, we are focusing on is 
how can we help improve the wider enabling environment in each country to which can help in scaling up LLA principles. And um, this comes from a notion that in its true spirit, LLA principles are looking at much longer term sustainable impacts which can be attained beyond project focused interventions. So in that case, enabling um, an environment becomes absolutely critical. And let me give you one example of how we would do that. So in the Mentimeter, one of the barriers which came up quite a bit high um, was um, centralized governance. So the idea was, how can we be more decentralized in governance processes? So if that's the, one of the barriers, I think what the way we would work is, um, in a particular country, you could try to understand which national agency is responsible for decentralization and local governance, both in terms of a functional de devolution and decentralization, as well as fiscal decentralization. And as um, Violet was saying, the function and the fiscal one has to act together because you just can't devolve function and not provide finances to the local governments to, to implement, for example. So we would then work with those agencies who are responsible for such decentralization and devolution and try to bring it the principles of local adaptation in their context. What does it mean for them? So if these ministries are responsible for, let's say, improving local planning processes, local budgeting processes, local project appraisal, or monitoring and evaluation of projects, we will try to then influence each of these processes and try to embed the, the spirit of LLA principles within those processes. So that's, that's the way we would work. But I think we have to be very cognizant over here that at the end of the day, adaptation demands not business as usual development. So decentralization or local development is not new to many countries and they've been doing it for years and years. But adaptation requires us to look beyond your business as usual processes to see how planning processes needs to change, how they have to factor in long-term understanding of climate risk and its uncertainties. You know, how do you factor in more learning processes within your project implementation? So it's it's so my two messages are if you really want to take this forward we have to identify the right agency for each of those principles. And the eight principles are very diverse actually. And you can't expect one government agency to lead all the processes, right? Identify the right agencies and work with them to embed it in government systems, but at the same time, recognizing that things need to change differently in order for us to deal with a development that is more climate resilient. So maybe I'll stop over here and I'll come back later. Thank you. Thank you, Arya. Um, I'm quite sure that what you, what you've just shared will uh, be become will be complementary to what the other uh, panelists are sharing. So I'd like to go to uh, Heather to share from uh, the perspective of CGRF. Like, what strikes you most about the barriers that were shared by the speakers, and what is your organization trying to address these? Thank you, Melvin, uh, and it's uh, thank you to, to Violet and Perry for some really stimulating um, examples and, and insights. I direct a fund that is a philanthropic fund. We um, pool resources from private foundations. So we're a really different funder than, um, than the Asian Development Bank that, that Argo just shared about. Um, we, our, our mission is supporting women and youth and indigenous peoples in um, building and scaling their own solutions for resilience, really working from the ground up. So we, um, you know, in contrast to the ADB, they, they work on the enabling environment with the government. We work with civil society organizations, uh, a real broad diversity of civil society organizations working at a number of different scales, um, international groups like both ends and very local groups, um, including in, in Kenya, not, not far from where Violet's examples have been. Um, and um, I think uh, we are fortunate in having a, a, a certain amount of flexibility that, um, that enables us to 
um, support advocacy, for example, to support a, a mix of activities and the projects that we support. So um, Perry gave that example of, of linking advocacy work with really on the ground implementation work. And we support a lot of organizations that find that as very powerful for um, empowering local communities and um, engaging at levels that, it, engaging in ways that really can begin to scale. Of course, it, there's a need for a great deal more of this. Um, it can be challenging as, as again, Perry mentioned, there's, there's a need for more um, core support for organizations so that they can really build their skill sets, build their um, staff, build their organization in ways that can have longer lasting effects, um, which are you know, almost always needed for scale. Moving away from a very project by project funding model is something that we're um, hoping to help many of our partners do. I think um, the two presentations we saw really gave some, some interesting contrast, you know, on the, the barriers and the examples coming from Perry's presentation are very on the ground, very much on the, the programmatic side of, um, you know, well, what's happening and, you know, with specific mining companies and relationships. And then um, Violet gave us a little bit more of a, a structural power analysis of, of some of the bigger picture challenges that are, are undermining um, uh, undermining local control and, and action and, and leading to a lot of um, you know, pollution and, and um, you know, really destructive practices. So, so the challenge I find for all of us is, is holding these two, these two shapes of the challenge at once of a lot of the program design, organizational development issues definitely need to be dealt with and at the same time, we have to figure out how to work on these, these broader underlying systemic and structural challenges. And to do those two things at once is, um, is I think, the, the real trick for, for getting past the, the suite of barriers that we've seen um, uh, presented here. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. There's, there's so much we're trying to do as a small fund. Um, um, I, could, I could talk about any number of different things, but we're, we're overall just positioned um, as an example, as kind of a pilot to try some new things, to try funding in some new ways and, and see what kind of traction I get. Thanks, Heather. It's quite fascinating to hear like what you can share from your perspective, perspective as CGRF or from the ADB's perspective, which you know are really complementary to each other, working with governments or on the other hand, working with civil society, more grassroots. I think the, the trick is in how to match these, how to make sure that we're working more together or at least work towards the same goal. And um, yeah, that's something we're trying to find out, I think, in this conversation as well. Um, then I'd like to give the, the word to Karen Stehauer to share a bit from her perspective from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. So what strikes you most about the barriers shared by the speakers and what are you, the organization, doing to address these? Yeah, thank you, Melvin. And uh, also um, thanks for um, to the speakers uh, before for presenting the scene and giving a, a good impression of those uh, challenges. Um, and um, some barriers that uh, that strike me and uh, that we are also trying to address um, is um, how to be inclusive, um, how to really have the people that um, uh, need action on the ground, have uh, faced those challenges, can take action. Um, and um, also that they are enabled um, to take the initiative that is most appropriate to them. And um, that is why uh, the Netherlands government um, is um, implementing the Reversing the Flow program through the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. And in this program, um, we try to allow um, lo um, local groups to um, initiate uh, projects uh, based on their needs um, and um, related to water security and climate adaptation. And one of the um, 
issues, uh, why this program was uh, started was um, evaluation by the Dutch government on uh, their uh, water programs. And only 10% of the funds from Netherlands water programs reached the communities. Um, and that doesn't mean that those other 90% did not have a good result, uh, but only 10% reached the communities and then still communities, the local people did not have much say in that. So in reversing the flow, we really try to address that issue. And the program uh, starts um, with um, an outlook up to 2026, but um, intends to um, uh, last until 2030. So already that provides a longer term funding outlook, um, providing a more patient funding stream. Um, and we try to reach those communities through um, a local organization. We call it a hub. Uh, but it can have many names. And uh, through the hub, um, communities can, can will be enabled to, to map their landscape. So using scientific data, but also um, indicating their aspirations. Um, and um, to take those initiatives and they can apply for funding to do what they think that is needed. And based on the knowledge they generate, uh, that can again be linked to, to policy and investment uh, dialogues. Um, so that, that links to, to some of the barriers and how we are working on it as a uh, Netherlands Enterprise Agency uh, through the Reversing the Flow program. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, it sounds like you're really trying to reverse that flow, which is if, if only 10% was actually reaching the local communities and yeah, there is still a long way to go, but I think this is just a very good start and um, daring as well. I think uh, we need bilateral donors to also reflect on their own policies, which which apparently the Netherlands is really doing. Um, so thank you for sharing that perspective as well. Um, Mohamed, uh, maybe would you like to share from the Adaptation Fund's perspective, um, what strikes you most about the barriers shared by the speakers and what are you doing to address these? Thank you. Uh, sorry, the kids are waking up here. <laughs> um, so hi everyone, uh, and and thanks uh, for 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 the excellent presentations. Um, and uh, and indeed, I mean the the barriers that have been outlined in this presentation are real ones. We experience them in our in our work. Uh, it strikes me to see that gender equality is still an an issue at the local level. Uh, Although most of the organizations that are working on uh, on the climate adaptation have uh, strong policies to address gender equality and and so on, but I still see that um, there is much to be done. So at the adaptation fund, as you know, we are um, one of the the climate fund that has been set up under the UNFCC, and we do work with uh, local based organization in in many ways. And one of the things that we have done since the creation of the fund is to do direct access modality. Um, this modality allows us to bring our funding directly to the people on the ground and countries can access this funding by making sure that their own organization can mobilize this funding. However, this doesn't guarantee that gender equality is, um, is, is being addressed. So what we do uh, is as part of the fund policy, we have uh, an environmental and social policy as well as a gender policy that uh, entities have to comply with when they when when they seek funding from us, and um, and and the fund uh, requires all of the implementing entity to mitigate uh, against the potential impact uh, that uh, can address um, can can impact uh, women, women and, and 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 girls when it comes to concrete adaptation actions. And in, in doing so, we, 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 we ask entities to proactively address um, the, the, these issues in the funding operations uh, and, and making sure that the, the, the power imbalance and the gender gaps that results in, in, in some of those uh, activities are uh, addressed in, 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 in these operations. And, um, and and we make sure that the the vulnerability that uh, that the women and girls are facing are being addressed as one of the objectives of the project. Um, one thing that we really want when we we fund project is to make sure that our activities are gender responsive, 
And to some extent, we even go beyond that, asking that our operations are gender transformative, meaning that we don't only make sure that the, the, the women and girls are being are, are benefiting from our project, but that activities supported by our project are creating some real change on the ground. And um, this takes into account the complexity of some of the gender equality on the ground, because sometimes it's not easy to address the gender equality because of this. So some of the issue, like uh, the colleague from Cameroon mentioned, the patriarchy. So through um, a, a, a constructive and an and inclusive dialogue, we make sure that those uh, structural system issues can be uh, addressed through policy dialogue and so on. Now, uh, one of the other barriers that I, I, I saw in this presentation is the, the need to address uh, adaptation with local solutions. And this is quite important for us. I mean, at the Adaptation Fund, we have quite a number of funding windows that uh, community-based organization can tap into. Uh, although the, these funding are not accessed directly by them, but at least they, they aim to, to strengthen this, this community-based organization. One of them that we have been implementing over the last few years is called Enhanced Direct Access. Um, through this window, uh, uh, we, we make sure that uh, the community is underground and, and these can be local so or associations, they can be municipalities and so on. They will be in a position to mobilize and implement those funding directly without necessarily having to go through this uh, national or regional system. The other one is the innovation window that we have had, uh, we have launched recently. And this window is the only window from the adaptation fund where non accurate entities can access. And for example, local association or even uh, local community based organization can directly access, access this funding. Um, uh, we are one of the, the, the partners that have been working with uh, the organization you, you mentioned at the beginning to come up with these local led adaptation principles. Uh, we can talk, talk about that later, but we're really proud to be part of this process because at least this strengthens our capacity to, to address this local led adaptation actions through this principle. And we believe that those are the right uh, thing to do for, for to make sure that the impact of our funding are being maximized on the ground. I'll stop here. Thank you, Mohamed, for sharing about the work that you're doing at Adaptation Fund and also I'm quite uh, glad, I must say, to hear about the um, even gender transformative uh, criteria, criteria that you're asking for, for projects. Um, yeah, which is really, really good to hear because I think that it remains a really big barrier, the patriarchy and the, the, the gender barriers that, that we still find in many places um, all over the globe, I'm afraid, but just in different um, meshes. Um, so I think that this is also a nice bridge to the next question that I have. And um, also, Violet and Perry, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, drop into the conversation as well. Um, I'd like to keep it as lively as possible. And the same goes for the um, audience. If you have questions, please feel free to enter them into, into the chat box. Um, so the next question that I was um, that I have lined up is, what is your organization's strategy to make funding accessible for grassroots organizations who work directly with communities on CBA? So Mohammed already shared about that a little bit from the Adaptation Fund's perspective. So how does that work? What is your organization really doing to make it really accessible to grassroots organizations? Um, which is one of the barriers also mentioned uh, by the LLA principles. Um, so maybe um, we can turn it around or maybe not do the same order. Um, Heather, can you start off? Sure. Um, um, we're, I think there's a couple, couple ways that, that we do this, and we're still actually, again, experimenting with, with other options. Um, uh, our funding tends to be um, what we call medium-sized grants. So usually in the order of $100,000 to $500,000, and usually over several years. Um, for some organizations, you know, this is four times their annual budget um, and, and not usually a size of grant that a grassroots organization can, can take. Um, so when we're when we're working with organizations like that, we, we tend to partner with organizations um, 
like both ends or the green, um, the global green grants fund uh, or the Pawanka fund, for example, organizations that are really good at um, dispersing very small amounts of money through their networks. And increasingly we work with what we call constituent driven networks or, or constituent led networks. Um, these are our social movements or, or networks that are actually owned and run by the civil society organizations on the ground, organizations of um, grassroots groups um, that, um, and that aren't, aren't just international NGOs that are regranting money, they're actually networks created by grassroots organizations and run by grassroots organizations. The Hawaii Royal Commission is one an example of one of these. And they're um, they're able to get funding to grassroots groups in um, in some unique ways. Um, another thing to to keep in mind that's part of our role for funding um, at the grassroots level is, you know, is that some grassroots organizations grow, and we're trying to pay more and more attention to the organizations that have grown from being very small and local to becoming capable of. Um, reaching policy impacts in their national capital, for example, or engaging internationally with players like the, the Adaptation Fund and um, the UNFCCC. The growth of, of grassroots organizations into something larger, whether that's through networks or just through the growth of a particular organization, this is something that we're eager to, to help fund and, and support. Um, I noticed there's a couple of questions for me in the chat here. I don't know, Melvin, if you want me to try to tackle those or should I pass this along so that we keep things dynamic? But at some point, you know, I should come back to this. Yeah, I feel like um, there are some questions indeed that you should come back to in, um, that, that were raised in the chat box. Um, I also saw one from uh, Perry, which is more about uh, capacity building. And then there's the other one by Achilam. Um, on about moving from project-based initiatives to a more sustainable approach or longer-term approach, I'm assuming. Um, maybe that question from Achilam is more in line with what you just shared. So maybe you can elaborate on, you know, what CGRF is doing to, you know, move to more reliable long-term funding. Yeah, so there's a few things involved here and they're, um, they're all very dynamic for us at the moment. Um, the first is that um, we uh, we have some longstanding partnerships now where we have shifted our funding from highly projectized funding to much more flexible funding. Once once our partnerships are established and there's there's trust on both sides, that's easier to do. There are bureaucratic barriers to doing it, unfortunately, and the way that we have been set up. Um, um, makes it um, actually particularly challenging internationally. And so we have been tweaking our budget format <laughs> to try to get around some of our own institutional constraints as a funder. And I'm happy to talk offline about some of the specifics of that, of, of how we, um, we shift to from that project funding to a uh, a more flexible um, budget format, while also not being able to completely become flexible, which is still a little bit of a frustration for me. Um, the second thing underway for us right now uh, that I hope some of you have heard about is we are, um, as an organization, actually really transforming our own governance. Um, uh, we, as I mentioned, are a um, a uh, fund that pools money from private foundations. And up until now, I have, as the director, reported to a board comprised of those foundations representatives. Um, they have taken the decision to hand power off, uh, to have the new board of the CGRF be comprised of activists and practitioners and people who work on the ground, not by funder representatives. And so this shift in power internally is it's underway right now. We actually hope to have the new board in place um, uh, before the climate COP this year. 
um, and, and <laughs> fingers crossed that that really happens um, because there's a lot of work involved and there's actually quite a lot of interest in this. But, um, but that shift in power of our structure, we hope will bring new creativity and, and new ideas around how to most effectively change the way that, that we do our support and move in a more, um, more flexible, longer term, more patient and more creative um, way. Um, that we, there are already some existing um, uh, grants that we've made and ways that we've made grants that have been um, you know, supporting specific capacity building efforts, for example, and organizational development or leadership development efforts. We, we have done that within our current constraints. Um, but this larger shift in our own systems um, where uh, opens up opportunities for us next year to, to really begin some new modes of grant making. Thanks, Heather, for sharing that. And yeah, the power shift is very, very interesting to hear. And yeah, you have the external context that you're dealing with, but then you also have your internal dynamics. And um, I think every organization is dealing with that. Um, definitely does sound familiar. Um, yeah, so I also see that some questions come up about data. Um, Swati from the World Bank um, mentioned that, and I also saw Perry asking that question. Um, maybe we can ask that question to Karen Stehauer. Um, the question, uh, Perry, maybe you can um, ask that one to Karen and then she can respond to that one. No. Yes, Perry, go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, my question was... Are you getting me? Yes. Hello. Yes, we hear you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my question was related. My question was related to capacity building and generating uh, uh, evidence-based data from the ground up. Most often, uh, we usually find uh, data being generated by consultants who come in and who are not really versed with the local context and local situation. So, how will uh, either the adaptation form or the climate resilient, climate justice resilient form, how do they look at these issues of generating efficient and genuine data from the ground up as how to come how communities are uh, responding to climate uh, impacts, either resiliency, vulnerability or sensitivity. And this also has to do with uh, managing risks as far as disasters and climate uh, is concerned. So, there are yeah. lots of data gaps on the grassroots and it's consultancy work in getting this data is really not sufficient. There is need for organizations that are embedded in these communities to understand the local reality, get to have some ways of maybe getting their own capacity of getting this data and bringing them up uh, yeah. from the ground up, like, like I speak. So, Thanks, Perry. I think, I think the is, question how is, is really form, clear. Yeah. How is the form uh, responding to that? Thank you. Yeah, really, really good question. I think that is also about a shift in power in, in, in knowledge, which knowledge counts and, and who do you give the capacity to generate knowledge? Um, Karen, maybe you can uh, respond to that one because I know that reversing the flow is, is actually dealing with that question as well. Yeah, thank you. A nice question. And um, um, also in um, generating knowledge, um, still for us, it remains a, a challenge on uh, who decides what. Um, but uh, the more you are thinking about shifting power, subsidiarity, local level decision making, the more you are aware of uh, the system you are part of and you're in. Uh, but um, to explain from reversing the flow what, what we are doing. Um, so the program will select six to uh, 10 landscapes. And by a landscape, I mean a catchment or a subcatchment or a river basin. In that landscape, we identify a local organization that can act as an intermediary between the Netherlands and the local communities. And before starting anything, um, there will be um, 
a detailed uh, landscape study that can have different forms, but uh, for sure it will combine scientific data and um, uh, stories from, from the uh, local people themselves. And um, how we have approached it right now, and, and this is also a bit of our challenge. So uh, there is a um, um, group of organizations that we have invited to do a first baseline study. And uh, that one is being done in uh, Kenya um, with our uh, first partner, Impact, in Isiolo. Um, so they have set up an approach, a step-by-step -step plan to collect the data, to create a, a map of the of the area. But um, it's them, the consortium, that have developed the approach and now support the organization to collect that uh, that data and to reach out to those communities and to facilitate the participatory process to generate uh, that data. Um, we don't know yet what, what the final form will be of that uh, baseline mapping, um, but um, one of the um, criteria for the form it will get is that it will be uh, it will be enabling to the local communities. For us as, as program managers, um, we want to use that data, of course, to learn from the program. But first of all, we put on we have put on top uh, the application at local level. So support the identification of uh, hotspots in the landscape uh, to identify priorities, uh, vulnerable areas, um, but also to, to give a range of options of what kind of actions can be taken. And um, we're also, um, um, we are going to work with um, a knowledge uh, who will bring together um, the information, the, those baseline data from the different landscapes um, to learn about the approach, because we have now set up the approach for the first baseline study, but is that the approach or should we adjust it um, to support um, the hub and the communities in each landscape that we start to go through that process. Um, so, um, um, local data collection and also valuing uh, that process and um, that local data is uh, has a central place in the in the program. Uh, but as I said, it's it's still um, um, a Western, a Netherlands-based uh, consortium that has set up the approach, and uh, that's still a step we can make, I believe, to um, uh, to make it more localized. That's a very honest and uh, yeah, good reflection you're you're sharing there, uh, Karen, at the end. And I think that's it's a learning process. I mean, shifting the power it doesn't happen for overnight. Um, so I think it's good that we're having that conversation honestly as well. Um, I'm also very curious to hear from you, Argya, um, how the ADB is looking at these kinds of um, shift the power discussions and yeah, what your reflections are um, on that. Uh, thanks, Melvin. I was listening to Heather speak and I was wondering, um, wish we, we could um, work in that, that manner, but unfortunately we all are in, have constraints in our own organization, so I think we have to be creative and find ways and how, how to address it. Um, so from our, our point, what we are looking is, yes, we cannot directly support grassroots organizations, it doesn't, doesn't work with us like that. However, uh, we have been working for past uh, three or four years uh, very closely with colleagues like IIAD colleagues, where we commission even CGRF actually, to design a program, which essentially uh, what it does is it will try to work with governments and identify government's own programs that allows resources to reach to the communities. Most governments have different programs, like social protection programs, community-driven development programs, or in agriculture or food security programs, which allows resources to go to the local level and hands of the hands of the communities and for them to decide how to spend the resources. So we are trying to work through those programs and try to influence the design of those programs so they are better able to meet the needs of the, of the local communities. And, and let me answer the question on data over here also in the same context. So most of these programs since are driven by governments with own budget, their own budget, 
they often rely on large scale government databases of let's say vulnerable population or poor, poor households or women headed households. And these are really large scale databases that have millions of you know, beneficiaries mentioned there. So one thing is to then work through those databases and ensure the, the science of climate is reflected in those databases, which are largely vulnerability databases, essentially. So how do you factor the climate information in that? So your targeting of your beneficiaries for these government programs improves from a climate lens. On the other hand, you're trying to see how those databases can try to bring information, more real-time information through grassroots organizations. Because a database is always usually static and you can't update it every now and then because it's quite expensive. But if a database has a mechanism where grassroots women's group, for example, are able to provide local information in those databases, then that, that's a way of actually engaging the grassroots communities, but also at the same time updating government's databases, which ultimately improves the targeting processes. These are some of the ways we are trying to work through government systems and really influence government programs to see how they can better deliver on LLA principles. And at the end of the day, essentially make sure money is reaching to the local level. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to hear this conversation unfolding and I feel like we're just scratching the surface and we could actually have been talking for another few hours. Uh, but unfortunately, we only have three and a half minutes left. Um, so my suggestion would be uh, respecting everyone's time that we come up with a key takeaway message in just 20 seconds or so, like from the panelists and the speakers, what is your key takeaway message from this conversation? It's hard. Don't think about it too much. Um, Mohammed, maybe you would like to give it a try. Um, start with your key takeaway message from this conversation. Yes, hi. Um, I guess it, it was quite important to hear from um, the grassroots organization some of the barriers that they are facing. And, and I, as I was saying, those are some of the barriers that we are seeing in our, in our programming. And, and I guess there is still uh, a lot to be done. And we hope that this can be uh, um, uh, uh, an opportunity to hear from them more. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we at the Adaptation Fund, we believe that the LLA principles are really addressing those barriers. And, and from our perspective, we, we are really ready to implement those principles. We have our programming criteria, and, and those are quite aligned with what the, the LLA principles are. And, and we hope that uh, this kind of conversation gives us an opportunity to hear more from the, the, the grassroots organization and, and to, to do more on, on those areas. I will stop here. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Just briefly, um, Heather, what's your key takeaway message? I'm I'm excited to hear that people, you know, across this set of speakers and panelists and commentators on the the chat, you know, people are working on these barriers at lots of different levels and lots of different ways. And I think that diversity is really encouraging and, and inspiring. So thank you, everyone. Can agree more. Um, Karen, what's your key takeaway message? Yeah, thank you. It's it's interesting indeed uh, to uh, to hear that uh, we're definitely not alone in this uh, in this uh, on this path. Um, th that's good to hear. Um, but um, it's also an exciting path uh, for us, and um, um, our own organization is also trying to to adapt uh, to um, those uh, locally led adaptation principles. Uh, but I think we're on the right track and I'm excited to, to continue that track. And, um, well, I've noted uh, as, as some, as some things like uh, the gender transformative criteria that uh, I think uh, are good to, um, uh, to keep high on the list uh, to, to further improve. Thank you. Agia. Uh, my key takeaway would be to essentially bring governments as a key stakeholder to each of such dialogues like this, because at the end of the day, for an organization like ours, we can only work at a scale when the demand comes from the government. So if you guys can bring the government 
prepare, prepare them and make them then demand you know, financial organizations, then it makes our life also much easier. So I'm just having, uh, my suggestion is purely from a selfish motive point of view, get the governments on there, let them create a demand, and then we can come and support as required. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Um, then I'd like to round up with the speakers who started, then they can also end. Uh, Violet and Perry, I'm very curious to hear what your key takeaway messages are, and also Alice, of course. Um, Perry, maybe you can start. Thank you so much, uh, Melvin. I think I'm very impressed by uh, the panelists, their responses, and uh, one of the key messages I could take from this session is the, 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 the idea of uh, the changes, the structural changes that they are willing to make within the organizations to, to respond to some of the barriers that we've mentioned here, uh, particularly uh, uh, curious to see how the adaptation fund, uh, the idea of transformative uh, gender equality, how is that going to work uh, in our own context where we know, and I'm sure uh, Mohammed, he said himself that uh, uh, patriarchy is embedded in our cultural practices. And so there's need for more dialogue spaces to bring in not just the women, but also the men to understand how we can go about these uh, structural uh, barriers and overcome them. So I'm very happy that's my keynote. Uh, my last message is uh, to see how those structural changes within the organizations can help us to overcome some of these barriers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Violet, what's yours? Yeah, so for me, it's, it's to say a big thank you to everybody because like uh, somebody said before me, it's interesting to see that we are all trying to break these barriers with okay with different types of uh, successes but the commitment is quite high and i think the more we can have these conversations the more we can bring in other key stakeholders i i, I like the way the the, the the gentleman from the asia development bank says to bring government on board and for me it's also to bring private sector on board because private sector has both good and can also do a lot of damage, but they can, they should also be brought into this conversation so that we can also see checks and balances so that private sector does not undermine the good work that is being done by government, by, you know, uh, funders like the ones in this panel. So thank you so much. It was a very enriching discussion. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Violet. And then lastly, Alice, can I hear your takeaway message? Um, what actually uh, caught my eyes and ears was the fact that there are actually uh, organizations that are willing to support local initiatives instead of just bringing ideas from the top, but to support what the communities are already doing uh, in terms of um, um, upgrading their life. And also that the organizations are also, uh, they want to see that the funds reach the local communities and that they transform their lives. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all of you, your key takeaway messages. And 